Uh, chapter 37, uh, just to go back over real brief, 33, we, we know that the, the city got destroyed in chapter 34. Uh, the wicked shepherds, God promised Israel that he was going to punish the wicked shepherds, take away the wicked shepherds, and not only give them better shepherds, but give them one shepherd, his his shepherd, the promise, the, the promise, like I said, from the destruction of the city on forward, now we're moving into the future, we're moving toward redemption and coming back. And in chapter 35, uh, the prophecy against Edom, and chapter 36 is the restoration of the land, the actual land itself. The land was going to rest while the captivity was going on, and God will restore the land back. He made promises to the land. And chapter 37 is the Valley of Dry Bones, which is the restoration of, of Israel as a nation the nation of Israel as a nation. Now, it's kind of interesting to keep in mind as we read through this, chapter 37, all of this, that these prophecies were uh, right around 2,500 years old. About 2,500 years ago, these things were written down. Ezekiel wrote this prophecy down, the valley of the dry bones and the restoration of Israel as a nation. And this, I want to read this because this is where it started. This is where the beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy of the Valley of the Dry Bones in chapter 37 started happening. It's still happening right now. It's still going on. And we'll get more into that as it goes. But this is where it started right here. This government has been informed that a Jewish state has been proclaimed in Palestine and recognition has been requested by the provisional government thereof. The United States recognizes the provisional government as the de facto authority of the new state of Israel. May 14th, 1948, signed by Harry Truman. That's when it started. That's when we're going to read about here in a minute. We're going to read in, in the second part of this. This chapter's in two parts. And in the second part, we're going to read about how that the nation is going to come back together. They're going to take a stick in one hand and a stick in the other hand. And there's not going to be any more no separate nations. And that's when that started. That's when, that's when they're coming together when there's no more separation. Because that's what's coming back now. They're all coming back. They're all the tribes, the lost tribes, the tribe of Jews, the tribe, but they're, they're all going back to Israel. That, 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 that wanting, that yearning inside of them that they can't explain, of wanting to return home. Some of them we talked about, we, we, we talked about it, some of them after the war was over, they wanted to go home. And they didn't want to go home to where they came from. They wanted to go to Israel. That, that want, that yearning, that, 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 that fire to get back came alive inside of them. And another thing that I've heard, I've, ne I've never been to Israel. Has anybody here been to Israel? Visited? Every single person that I've ever talked to that has been to Israel has, has, has said this and it, to me in some form or another that when they get there, as soon as the plane lands and they get off of the airplane, they feel like that they've come home. They get a feeling inside of them and that feeling, if they're born again Christians, I mean, that's, that, why else would you want to go and visit the Holy Land? But, but the, the, every one of them has made that statement to me that, that, that you can't get over that, that feeling of the only other feeling that time that you feel that when you get off that airplane in Israel is when you come home after being gone from home for a long time. There's no other way to describe that feeling. Every single body that I know that's been to Israel. And not only that, every time they go. Because there's nowhere else. If you're like me at all, and, and I didn't notice this until... I didn't notice this in, until probably about 10 years ago or so. But but there is a there is a there is a there is a feeling inside of me. There there is a an actual love that was placed inside of me for the city of Jerusalem, for a place that I've never been. I'm, I've, I've read about it. I'm, I'm, I've heard. Of, I've always knew there was a place called Israel, and there was a city called Jerusalem, and there was a Temple Mount. But 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 that 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 love for a place that I've never been outside of dying and going to heaven is is there, and it's not anything that 
it's not it's not been cultured there by me it's not been because I sought out to learn all I could about Israel that was placed in me by God a love for his city and a love for his people because that's that is his chosen city that's his chosen patch of dirt that's why he prophesies to that land I don't have any problem whatsoever believing alongside the rabbis that that little patch of ground is the same patch of ground that Isaac went to, with, I mean that Abraham took Isaac to, and it's the same place where God scratched up the dirt and formed Adam. I have no doubt whatsoever believing along with them that that's true. No, no way to prove it, but I believe it because that, that place is holy. It's holy to God. It's holy unto Him. How else can you describe... I mean, I know a lot of people got cow pastures bigger than the Temple Mount, but that, that literally 37 acres of land, that's 37 acres, is literally the center of the earth. And it's the center of the political turmoil of every nation on this globe. Think about that. You can put seven Israels inside of the state of Alabama, seven of them. That's how little that place is. But look at how much time and effort it gets, how much attention it gets. Everybody on earth knows about Israel. There is country after country after country in Africa and, and Russia and everywhere that you can name and people. I mean, Jimmy Kimmel and Jay Leno sends people out on the street all the time and people have no clue who our president, who, who our vice president is. They can't, they can't look at a picture of John Kerry and tell you who he is. But just about everybody on earth has heard about Israel and has heard about Jerusalem in some form or another. This little bitty, tiny, dirty, dusty place. But it's God's piece of land. It's His land. It's His chosen people. And like I said, like I said, I think it was last week. If, you, if, if there's any, if there's one word that can prove that the Bible is absolutely true, that one word would be Israel. Because it's it's it it is it is just exactly like the Bible says. It is the cup of trembling and the stumbling block for the entire earth. No questions asked. So these people have been exiled. Ezekiel has told them now for for seven now from from the time the temple is destroyed until the chapter forty when Ezekiel starts telling us about the coming temple is the next time frame and there's about twelve or thirteen years in there. So these this chapters thirty seven, thirty eight, and thirty nine has no stamps on it. That, we don't have no stamps. It could have been it could have been written down any time in between those two spaces because there's there's nothing in here that dates these three chapters but they're somewhere within that 12, 13 year range. <clears throat> and like I said, this is, it's a prophecy of everything's coming back. Redemption is coming back. Renewal. God is he's telling them hey, over and over and over again, I'm going to bring you back home. I'm going to bring you back from the nations. I'm going to bring you back from where you were scattered. I'm going to tell the winds to bring you home. I'm going to tell you, you're going to come home. Every single one of you. All of you, he says, they're all coming back to the land that he promised him where their fathers have already dwelt. See, that's, that, 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 that's important to remember that, that these things are in there because a lot of people will tell you that this means all kind of things. A lot of people that tells, will tell you that chapter 37 is a description of the resurrection of the individual proof that the resurrection is going to happen. There's a lot of teachings out there like that. A lot of people is going to tell you that because they speak of the, the, the stick being passed to Joseph and Ephraim, that this is biblical proof for the Book of Mormon. They'll tell you all kinds of things based on this. So it's, it's, it's important to remember that, that, that God is prophesying here about something that's happening now that's an ongoing thing. It happens in stages. It comes together piece by piece by piece. And it's not been fulfilled yet. But he's also speaking of the land wherein their fathers have already dwelt. There's no mistaking. This is not. This is not uh, allegory. It's not. It's not conjecture. It's not any of those things. It's a fact about the restoration of the nation of Israel. And in fact, verse 11 says that very thing: that it is the nation of Israel. So. 
With that being said, verse 1 in chapter 37, The hand of the Lord was upon me and carried me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of bones, and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, <clears throat> Son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, thou knowest. Now that, that strikes me as being kind of funny. Because Ezekiel probably don't realize what's going on here. He don't, he don't, he don't really know exactly what's going on here. So when God asked him a question, like that's a loaded question. So he didn't just come out right now. He's smart enough. He didn't come right out and answer. And he's answered it exactly like I hope that I would answer a question. Oh, you know. You know. I don't know. You know. You 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 know. <laughs> I just I just thought that was kind of funny. It's safe on Ezekiel's part. Verse four. Again he said unto me, Prophesy unto these bones and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, look in Deuteronomy chapter 32, real quick. Deuteronomy 32. Starting in 35, uh, verse 30, yeah, 35 through 40. To me belong with vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants. When he seeth that their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left, and he shall say, Where are their gods? their rock in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices and drank the wine of their drink offerings. Let them rise up and help you and be your protection. He's saying, God is saying this to them, says, where's the people that you trusted? Where are your gods in your day of trouble, in your day of calamity? Where's all these gods that you served? Why don't you call out to them? Why don't you let them rise up and help you out? Because there aren't any gods besides him. There are no gods other than our God. <clears throat> Verse 39, See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. I wound, and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. He's the only one that can lift up his hand to heaven. He's the only one that can swear. And he said in his word, because he could swear by no other greater name than his own, he swore by his own name. He is the only God. He created life. He's the only one that can create life. He's telling Ezekiel, he's the, he's the only one that can do it. And when he's talking to Ezekiel about these bones, Ezekiel knows this. God is the only person, is the only one, is the only thing that can bring this back together. Over and over and over and over in Ezekiel's prophecies, he has said it time and time again, so that you will know that I am God. He will prove himself to us. He proved himself to his people then. He'll prove himself to us now. We serve a mighty God, and only he can give life. Only he can take life, and only he can give life. So in verse 5, Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you, and you shall live. Now, he is the only person that can do that. And Ezekiel had to believe this just like we do by faith. Look in John chapter 5. John 
John chapter 5, starting in verse 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judges no man, and hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Only God can raise up the dead. And we believe that. We believe in our, this is how, we, we, we trust in our resurrection. Has anybody in here ever seen anybody dead brought back to life? Nobody. I hadn't either. But yet we trust and we believe and we have faith in Almighty God who says there's a resurrection coming. That he's going to bring. He told them. He said, I'll, I'll come and get you. I will bring you back from the dead. The dead, they know my voice. And they can hear me. They'll hear me. They'll hear from the graves. They'll hear me call out. And we believe that by faith. We believe that by faith. And by faith, we move God. With our faith is how we're saved. What did Jesus tell everybody? Your faith, your faith has made you whole. Your faith has made you whole. He told Nicodemus, that don't call me good. There ain't no good in me. This was Christ. The man. God, the man. Christ, the God. He said, there's no good in me. I can't do anything that my father don't tell me. And he said, not only can I do these things, you can do these things also. Because your faith made you whole. We do these things, we believe these things by faith. Ezekiel was speaking out in faith. Everything he's done so far, everything he's prophesied so far, he's been he's had a handle on it, kind of. He spoke things that were going to happen, and he stood back. God has told him to do certain things, and he's done them. He's cut his hair, he built his cities, he played with his toys. He did all. He did these things. But now God's saying, speak and prophesy, and let me show you what's going to happen. That's what he's saying. Let me show you what's going to happen. And he has to believe him by faith that he can do that. Back in Ezekiel, verse 6. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I commanded, and I prophesied. There was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to the bone. Now notice in verse 6, this happened in stages. He said, I will put sinews on you. I will put flesh on you. I will cover you with skin. And the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put breath into you. It happens in stages. They don't, just, they don't just all come back together and jump up and start breathing. It happens in stages because it's going to happen in stages because it's been happening since 1948. It's a process. It's all coming together because the Bible, the prophecy clearly says that all of Israel is going to be back home where they came from. But there's still a lot of things that we have to go through before the breath the spirit can be placed because in, in, in Ezekiel the word wind and breath and spirit, the spirit's not in this chapter but the wind and breath, both are the same word, it's all the same word and it's the same as the spirit is used all through the Old Testament these are all the exact same word, the wind and the breath and the spirit because the breath hadn't come back into Israel yet the breath hadn't entered into them they're up, they're walking around they're doing things, they're making money they're, they're, they're doing exactly what Jeremiah told them to do. They're biding their time. They're buying houses. They're planting fields. They're, they're raising kids. They're making money. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. But the breath, Romans chapter 11 says, the blindness in part, the breath is not in them yet. The breath hasn't entered into them. Because the Spirit came for the church. It came for the church. So this happens, and in, in it's a process. This, 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 this is a little, little, little bit at a time. So verse 7, So I prophesied, and I was commanded, and I was prophesied. There was a noise, and behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them. And the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Look in uh, Joel 
chapter 2. <clears throat> this is real. Uh, this is a, should be a pretty well known uh, piece of scripture. Most of the time we hear it read in Acts because it was quoted uh, by Peter in, in, in the book of Acts. But let's listen to the book of Joel because the book of Joel is prophesying to this time, to this day. The book of Joel is prophesying basically the same thing that Ezekiel was prophesying about the end times. And the same thing that Zechariah was prophesying about the end times. They were all prophesying things that are yet in our future. They're in our future. They're ahead of us. We ain't got there yet. We're headed that way quick. But we haven't got there yet. Joel chapter 2, verse uh, 23, starting in verse 23. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately. And he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floors shall be full of wheat. And the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. And you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God that hath dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed." And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel and that I am the Lord your God and none else and my people shall never be ashamed. Like I said, this is in our future. These days are not now. The Holy One of Israel is not dwelling in His dwelling place in the midst of Israel yet. He's going to, but He's not there yet. It's still in our future. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your younger men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth blood and fire and pillars of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, in Mount Zion, in that little tiny, scrappy, dirty, filthy place over there, where that dome, where the Muslim dome sits right now, Mount Zion, Mount Zion that God has called out from, from everlasting to everlasting. In Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. In that day, in that day, as the Lord has said, and in the, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. This is in our future. This is a promise for the state of Israel. This is a promise for the Spirit to come back to them that has not they have rejected the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. They reject that because that Spirit calls them to repentance. It calls them to Jesus Christ. And it, call, it, calls, it calls all of those whomsoever will. And they've rejected it as a nation. It's not there yet. It's still in their future. In Zechariah chapter 12. Starting in verse uh, 6. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they, will do, they shall devour all the people round about, on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Again, they're going to come together. They're going to be called together as one people, as one nation, with one shepherd and one God. 
In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. He'll be a mighty man of valor. And the house of David shall be as God. That's pretty strong words. As the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour, listen to this, and I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. In that day now, bear in mind what we're talking about here. In that day that ain't here yet. In that day and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now bear in mind, I was listening to the, the preacher not too long ago, and uh, I did a little research about this, but I didn't, I didn't do a whole lot. But, but there was about 750 years between the writing of these words by Zechariah and the actual first use of a, of a crucifixion as a form of capital punishment. When these words were penned, nobody ever got pierced. Nobody had ever heard of anybody being pierced. That's, a, that's amazing to me. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. They don't mourn for him now. They don't mourn for him who they pierced. They don't mourn for the lamb that they slay in the streets. They don't mourn for him now. That's, this, this is, again, I'm, I'm just trying to make the point. These things are all, they're in our future. They're yet to come. Ezekiel was speaking to a land that isn't even there yet. He looked across time. God showed him these visions of these things across time that were going to happen. Things that were, that were many, many decades, many centuries from coming to pass. They will mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. They're going to mourn for him one day. They're going to feel sorry. The book of Isaiah says they're going to look on him and they're going to loathe themselves. They're going to loathe themselves because their sins and iniquities will become clear at that time because that veil is going to be lifted. The veil that, that Paul talks about that's there in part, it's going to go away. It's going to be lifted. It's going to come off of their eyes. The scales are going to drop off of their eyes and they're going to see Christ Jesus for who he really is. But that's still a good ways off and our future is still a, a, a good ways ahead. It's not all that long, not many more days. I hope not for their sake and for ours, for mine. I'm, I'm ready to get off of this rock myself, although we're coming back, but, but I'm, I'm ready to go for the time being. <clears throat> back in Ezekiel 37. Then said he unto me, Prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind. Thus saith the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these that are slain, that they live, they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived. They stood up on their feet, an exceeding great army. Now what I like about this scripture is that he told, remember, remember that in Genesis, when he, when he created man, it says that he reached down and he got dirt in his hand. And he formed man with his hands. Everything else he had spoken into existence. Everything. He blew the stars. He blew the universe out of his nose. And he spoke everything into existence except for man. He reached down and he formed man with his hands, with the dirt. And he breathed. He breathed into him. That breath of life came from him. But here in Ezekiel, when he's talking about restoring the nation, restoring his people Israel, he told Ezekiel to prophesy to the wind that the wind would blow in them and bring life back into them. He didn't say, get them up on their feet and I'm going to breathe life into them. He said, you prophesy to the wind, the life, the spirit that was already on the earth. So that spirit is already going to be back on the earth. What is that saying? What is that, what, what is that point now? The coming at Pentecost, the spirit came. 
the spirit remember spirit wind breath it's all the same word in the new testament is greek in the old testament is hebrew but it's still the same word for all those words it's the same exact root word that that life at that time that life is already going to be on the earth it's already going to be here that spirit that's going to breathe that spirit you're getting what i'm saying the spirit the holy ghost is here it's already here. It's already on this earth. It's already operating in this earth. And he's telling Ezekiel, prophesy to the wind and tell the wind to bring them back to life. Well, like I said, only God can do that. So the only wind and only the Spirit of God is going to be able to put breath into dead, dry bones. It happened at Pentecost. I'm speaking of Pentecost here. That, that comforter, Jesus said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to send a comforter, and he's going to be with you forever. And he's going to be here in person on the face of the earth until we're raptured off. And he's saying, call my nation home. Give them breath. That spirit is going to give them that breath. The spirit is what's going to lift that veil from off of their eyes. The wind that's already on the earth. The same wind. The four corners. The four winds that in the book of Revelation he says hold back. I looked and I saw four angels and they were holding back the winds of the earth. And another angel said hurt not anything until we mark the 144,000, the 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jews, the Jewish virgins who are going to preach the gospel during the tribulation time. He told that same wind, that same spirit, that same breath to hold fast, to stay away, to not do anything until we mark those that are supposed to be marked. Like I said, at that time, Paul says, he that now lets will let until he is taken out of the way. Because at some point in time, that wind, that church, the church is leaving here. And when the church leaves here, the wind, the spirit, the breath that was given to the church is going with it. It's going to be held back. And the 144,000 are going to do their work. Am I lost anybody? Is anybody... Am I, am, I, am, I, am I? You understand what I'm saying? That wind. He spoke to Ezekiel and said, "Tell the wind to breathe life." And the wind was already the, the life was already there. The wind was already here on the earth because the spirit of God is the only thing that can bring life into these dead soldiers, into these into these dead people, into these dead bones that are just standing there with no life in them. Okay. Verse eleven. I'm sorry, turn to John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 25. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself, and hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Jesus is saying they're going to hear my voice. The dead are going to hear my voice. The dead are going to hear my voice and know my voice. The dead, the same people that are standing on the ground, standing on their feet in the valley of dry bones, as Ezekiel saying them, they're standing upright. But they're not doing anything because they don't have any breath in them yet. The dead. The dead are going to hear his voice. We're going to hear his voice. If we're, if we're gone and we're in the ground, when it's time, when the rapture, this is speaking of the, rap, the resurrection. The rapture. The, the, when the rapture and the resurrection happens at the same time, they're going to they're come out of the ground first, Paul says. 
And then we which are alive and remain are going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. But we're going to see these dead come out of the ground because they're going to hear His voice when He said Lazarus come forth. We're going to hear His voice and we're going to break out of the ground and come forth. I hope I'm not losing anybody. I hope, I hope, I hope I'm making myself clear. I, I can see it up here, but a lot of times it don't get out of here like, like, I, like I want it to. Um, verse 11 in Ezekiel. Then he said unto me, son of man, in case anybody there's any doubt about any of this, he said unto me, these bones are the whole house of Israel. These are my people. These are the ones who have died in their sins and their iniquities. These are the ones who are alive now. These are the ones who are in captivity. These are the ones who are my people who I called out and called by my name and they turned their back on me and they've died and they went away. He said, this is the whole house of Israel. Every single one of them. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. We read it in, in, in Psalms several times where, where the, the Israel has cried out and said that he's forgotten us. God, we, the God don't know us anymore. When they were approached about the activities that were going on in the temple before it was destroyed, they said, we do this because God has forgotten who we are. We cry out to Him and He don't answer. He don't answer because they're crying out in their own sins and they're serving Him and worshiping Him in their lusts. They're going through the motions, but they're seeking the, 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 the fulfillment of their own lust. That's why He don't hear them. Not because He's forgotten who they were or deserted them or went away. And that's what they're saying to That's what He's saying. He said, they're saying that our bones are dead and dried up. And, and, and our hope is lost because God's forgot us. Therefore prophesy in verse 12 and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you into the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord. When I have opened your graves, O my people, and brought you up out of your graves, and shall put my spirit into you. What did Zechariah say? Then they're going to look on him and recognize who he was and realize who he was. They're going to look on him who they pierced. And you shall live, and I shall place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it. Look in Zechariah chapter 14. Verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and thy spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations, that's all, that's every single one of them, I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. And the city shall be taken, and the houses rifled, and the women ravished. And half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations. See, that sounds kind of like what's already happened. That sounds kind of like the captivity that's already come before them. But remember, Jesus, the Lord of hosts, he didn't go before them and fight in that day. God told them, what God tell them? said, they're going to come in, they're going to take you over, and they're going to kill all of you, except for these few that I put a mark on their head. So we're not talking about the Babylonian captivity here. We're not talking about the Syrian captivity. So we must be talking about something that's in our future, because as far as I know, history don't record the Christ fighting in the day of battle for the city of Jerusalem yet. But he will. He's going to. So all this ravaging and, and all this pillaging and all this is it's, it's yet to come. I'm telling you, the, the, the prophecy in Isaiah about Damascus said that Jacob's going to wax lean. There's going to be few of them left. Over and over and over, Ezekiel said there will be a remnant, small, tiny, small number of these people that are going to be left behind. It's horrible to think about. It's horrible. It's awful. But it's God's Word. That's what's going to happen. And it ain't happened yet. It's coming. As much as Israel has been through, there's still more to come. 
sadly to say, because they are, what did God tell Ezekiel in the, in the first two chapters? They're a stubborn and they're a stiff-necked people. And he said, I'm going to send them to you, and they speak the language that you speak, but guess what? They ain't going to listen to a word you say. They're not going to hear a single, that's exactly what he told Ezekiel. He said, you go and speak my word, and none of them is going to listen to you, because they're stubborn and they won't hear. They don't want to drop their flesh. They don't want to do away with their lust. They don't want to do away with their idols and their sinful ways. They're going to reject what you have to say. He told Ezekiel that from the beginning. They're not going to listen to you. And guess what? That trait still runs in human beings because we're still a stiff-necked and rebellious people. All of us are. And the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight, and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. Now if you remember back, if you go back and read Joshua chapter 5, you'll remember that he showed up for Joshua and he went with him at the battle of Jericho. It wasn't just Joshua and the Ark of the Covenant out there. It was Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the, the host of the army of the Lord right there with him. And his feet shall stand in that day, verse 4, his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst. There's another way you know this ain't happened yet, because the Mount of Olives is still standing there in all its pride and glory. It's still right there about a half a mile outside the eastern gate. But it says here it's going to cleave in the midst toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azael. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye did, like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, the king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. He's coming. He's going to take care of this. He's going to fight this battle. Redemption and restoration of the nation of Israel is going to happen. It's promised. He promised these people this. He promised them then, and it's happening. It's happening little by little, just like it happened in the Valley of Dry Bones in front of Ezekiel, little by little. First the bones came together, then the sinews came up, then the flesh came up, then the skin covered them up. And then he prophesied to them and said, breathe the life back into them so that they can breathe. And then he announced to them, this is the whole, this is the nation of Israel. This is the whole house of Israel. Back in Ezekiel, verse 15. And we switch gears here, we change gears here, and we start talking about the restoration of them as according to the, the, the splitting. Because without going into a whole lot of detail, you remember when Solomon died, God told Solomon, said, not for your sake, but for your daddy's sake. I'm not going to snatch this power out of your hand, but it's definitely coming out of your kids. And as soon as Solomon closed his eyes, Jeroboam and Rehoboam went at each other, and the nation split, and the ten tribes went north. The ten tribes of the north became known as Israel. And the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, became known as Judah or what Judea, what Jesus referred to in his day as Judea. When he talks about Judea, that's what he's talking about, the, the kingdom of the south. And what, what he's fixing to describe here is that the whole nation is coming back together. They're not going to be split. There's not going to be any northern tribes or something. There's not going to be any, there, nobody's going to be paying tribute or paying homage to anybody anywhere else. There's going to be one tabernacle, there's going to be one God, and there's going to be one shepherd, the prince, David the Prince. And they're going to rule forever and ever. Forever and ever. Verse 15, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick. Now stick here don't mean like a stick you pick up out of the yard. It, said, it refers more to, in Numbers chapter 17, remember Moses had told everybody to divide you up into 12 tribes and make you a stick or a staff or a scepter to represent each one of the tribes. And they were set up, remember we went through the lesson, they were set up at the heads of the tribes when the tabernacle was set up with their standards on them. And which house they were in and which tribe they were a member of. This is the stick that he's referring to here, not just like 
a stick like you pick up out of the yard or, or whatever. A lot of people, it's, it's amazing on the internet what what people will write and say that there's a scrap of wood and it's, you know, it's ashes out of the fires. And I, did, I don't know where, they use all these scriptures to, to, to say all these really strange things if you go, so just don't go. I, I, I mean, you, you can, but it's, it's amazing what you find. Anyway, take thee a stick and ride upon it for Judah and for the children of Israel and his companions. And then take another stick and ride upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel and his companions. Now look in Second Chronicles chapter 11. Second Chronicles chapter 11, we'll start reading in verse 5. And Rehoboam dwelt in Jerusalem and built cities for defense in Judah. He built even Bethlehem and Edom and Tekoa and Bethzur and Shoko and Adullam and Gath and Marishah and Ziph and Adoram and Lachish and Azekiah and Zorah and Ajalon and Hebron which are in Judah and in Benjamin fenced cities and he fortified the strongholds and put cap captains in them and store of victuals or food and of oil and wine. And in every several city he put shields and spears, or he set up soldiers to protect all these cities, and made them exceeding strong, having Judah and Benjamin on his side. And the priests and the Levites that were in all of Israel resorted to him out of all of their coasts, for the Levites left their suburbs and their possession and came to Judah and Jerusalem for Jeroboam and his sons had cast them off from executing the priest's office unto the Lord. And when uh, uh, Jeroboam went north and he built his own temple and he built his own golden calves and he told them, he said, these are your gods. He told them, these are the gods that brought you out of Egypt. These are the gods that are protect you and watch over you. These are the gods that you're going to serve. And the Levites apparently would argue with him, so he didn't want the Levites there because they had served God all their life. So he kicked them out. So the south, what, what was known as Judah, became Ju the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin and the Levites. And the north was everybody else. Verse 15, And he ordained him priests for the high offices and for the devils and for the calves which he has made. Talking about um, Jeroboam. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the Lord God of Israel, came to Jerusalem to sacrifice unto the Lord God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So when the scripture says back in Ezekiel chapter 37, it says right on it for Judah and the children of Israel. All those children of Israel that were affiliated with Judah, all those children, all those Levites that came down after the split. Because anybody that wanted to could come back. Anybody that had left with the ten tribes and went north, if they decided that things wasn't exactly like they think they ought to be, they were they were absolutely it was absolutely perfect for them to come back. They could come back. So it's making reference to for Joseph and the stick of Ephraim for all the house of Israel, his companions. That's what that's what they're referring to, his companions. Anybody who wanted to join forces was either side could. Just like we have choice. We can, we can join whichever side we want to. We can choose to serve God and live by His statutes and His commandments, or we can choose to walk in our own, walk in our own way and do what we want to do. We have that choice. They had that choice. We had that choice. They could do whatever they wanted to do. Verse 17, And join them one to another into one stick. In other words, he's saying take both of these sticks and put them together in your hand, and they shall become one in thine hand. And when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Wilt thou not show us what thou meanest by these? Say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel his fellows, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, and make them one stick, and they shall be one in mine hand. 
He's going to bring them back. He's going to put them back in the land where they had dwelt. He's going to give them back to the land where their fathers had dwelt. And they're going to be one people. And see, that's exactly the way it's happening over there. There are very, very, very few Jews today, nowadays, that can tell you what tribe they're from. And then when they do, most times they're just making a really educated guess. Because it's been scrambled, it's been lost, because they got Jews coming from Russia, they got Jews coming from all over the earth coming back in that have been separated. This captivity, this final captivity has went on since after the after Christ. Two thousand years they've been gone. And this this settling, this yearning, this wanting, this drive that God announced to Ezekiel way back when is, is, is affording them to come home. It's telling them that they need to go home and they're coming from all parts of the earth. They're coming. Uh, Mike's got a movie that I wish we could watch some Wednesday night about the searching out the ten lost tribes of Judah because that guy in 1998, he found, he found members of these tribes all over the earth. He found rocks in the middle of nowhere with Hebrew writing on it, and people he'd walk up and start reading them. And the people, the the the, the village elders, had got upset because he could read their language. They want to know, you know, what kind of what kind of man are you? And you come walking in here out of the woods, and, and and they're they're all over the place, but they're coming back together. And when they come back to Israel, they're they're coming home. They're not saying, "I'm coming back to join my tribe." or I'm coming back to be a part of Judea, or I'm coming back to be a part of the northern tribes. Because what Jesus told the woman at the well, she said, our grandfather said, we're supposed to worship over here on this mountain. And your people said, we're supposed to worship over there on the mountain. What that mountain? What Jesus tell her? The day's coming and now is when you're not going to worship on either one of these mountains. Because that don't count. Because God said He's going to take these two people and He's going to take these two sticks and He's going to join them together and they're going to forever and ever and ever be what they should have been from the beginning. The nation of Israel. His chosen people. And I will make them... Verse 22. Well... Uh, Verse 20, And the sticks whereon thou writest shall be in thy hand before their eyes. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, from among the nations, whither they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them into their own land. The land that he promised them, their land. And I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all, and they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms any more at all. In Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah 11, verse 12 and 13, And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. And Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. In Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah 3, verse 17 and 18. At that time, they shall call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord. Don't call it that now. Now it's the place of the al Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock. At that time shall they call Jerusalem the throne of the Lord, and all the nations shall be gathered unto it to, name, to the name of the Lord, to Jerusalem. Neither shall they walk any more after their imagination of their evil heart. I like that. In those days the house of Judah shall walk with the house of Israel, and they shall come together out of the land of the north to the land that I have given for an inheritance unto your fathers. I gave it as an inheritance unto your father. That land, that dirty patch of dirt that sits over there that the whole world looks about, worries about, troubled over. 
Verse 23, Neither shall they defile themselves any more with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places wherein they have sinned, and I will cleanse them. So shall they be my people, and I will be their God. And David, or the Messiah, David, my servant, shall be king over them, and they all shall have one shepherd. Everybody's going to have one shepherd. Everybody's going to travel across the earth once a year to where? To Jerusalem. Why? To visit the temple. Why? Because that's where Jesus is. That's where he's ruling from. Everybody on the whole earth. And the Bible says if, if, if somebody from everywhere on the earth don't show up at Jerusalem every year, their land, their sun is going to shine twice as hot on their land and the rain is going to fall half as much. So what does that mean? They ain't going to eat. Everybody on earth is going to go and visit the king, the one king, the one shepherd over the whole earth, David, my servant. And they shall have one shepherd, and they shall walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. All right, let's look in Second Samuel. We've read this a thousand times, but you know that's why you remember songs because you listen to them over and over and over on the radio. Second Samuel chapter seven, <clears throat> starting in verse ten. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel. Remember, this is da this is Nathan talking to David, King David. I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as such the time that such as since as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord telleth thee that he will make thee an house. David wanted to build God a house. And Nathan told David that God's gonna build you a house. How humble is that? And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Forever. Those aren't light words. Those, that's not a misprint. That's not a typo. And that means literally forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established again forever. Before thee, thy throne shall be established forever. I think he's trying to make a point. He repeated himself three times in the same sentence. He's trying to make a point. This is going to go on forever. According to verse 17, according to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak unto David. Back to verse 24, And David, my servant, the Messiah, shall be king over them, and they shall have one shepherd. And he shall sit on the throne. What does he say? He's going to sit on the throne of his father David. That's what Jesus said. Forever. And he shall walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And I like that too. He's going to walk in his judgments. Because there's going to be judgment forever. People are going to be judged forever. He's going to walk in my judgments and in my statutes. In other words, he's going to obey my rules and he's going to do what I've told him to do forever and ever and do them. And they shall dwell. Pay close attention to verse 25. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob, my servant. Now, who is Jacob? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Jacob's name was changed and Jacob became 
Israel. Jacob was the father of 12 sons who became the 12 tribes of Israel. So this land that God is speaking to them about is the land that he promised Jacob. Wherein your fathers have dwelt. Past tense. This is the land where your fathers have already dwelt. That dirty, dusty place on this, that's the point I'm trying to make here, on this earth, this place, this Israel, the Israel that's coming, not the Israel that's there now, because that's a fake and a fraud. The Israel that's coming, the Israel that's holy unto God, the Israel that Abraham laid out with his footsteps from the land of Ur where God called him, whom a God that nay Abraham had never even heard of, called him out of that place and said, leave your father and come and do what I tell you to do. And he marched them all the way across the northern end of the top of the map through Afghanistan and Uzbekistan and all that up through there and marched them all the way down to the banks of the Mediterranean all the way down into Egypt. Not that little tiny landing strip of a piece of land that they call Israel now. 900 times the size of what the nation of Israel occupies now. That little small place that the whole world wants to fight over and scrap over. That's the heart of where they're going back to, but that's not all of it because they're getting it all back. Because he's telling them that the land where your fathers have dwelt. Abraham slept in a lot of places between the land of Ur on 1,800 miles he walked to Egypt where he turned around and he came back. He camped and he slept and he dwelt in a whole lot of places. That's the land that's promised to the nation of Israel. That's where this is headed. That's the land that God is talking about here. That's what's special to his heart. When they divide the land in the book of Joel, yeah, it's that little scrap that they're over there now, the one that John Kerry's trying to work, trying his best, sweating bullets, trying to work out a deal between what is Israel now and, and, and so-called Palestine, the Palestinians, that little scrap. That, 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 that's what's there now. That's what we can see, but that's not what's coming. It's like I said, Israel's a very proud of and, give, and, and, and does due diligence to God to give him credit for the agricultural and, and, and the things that go on in the nation of Israel. They've invented more stuff than anybody else on earth. They're, they produce more things for a country and a population of their size. There's nowhere on earth that can touch that place. Nowhere. But it's only a minuscule part of the land of milk and honey that God promised to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. That's what he's offering back here. That's what he's saying you're getting back to here now. Not what's over there now. That's just a little small part of it. The land wherein your fathers have dwelt, and they shall dwell therein. Even they and their children. Now, it's the ones that are coming back. The ones that are going to be picked up from the four corners of the earth and placed there by the hand of God. Their children and their children's children, again, forever. Forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever. That temple is going to sit there forever. Amen. Jesus is going to rule there forever on this dirt, on this chunk of dirt that we live on right now because God is promising this to these people's fathers where they have dwelt past tense where they've already been, not some other earth in the future that's coming. This one right here, this is his land. This land, this land where he first reached down and gathered up a handful of dirt and turned it into a living, breathing human being with a soul and a spirit and a mind of its own. This land will always be special to God. Forever and ever, he says. Verse 26, Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant. Again, there's that forever thing. And I will place them and multiply them and set my sanctuary in the midst of them. How long? Forevermore. 
forever and ever and ever. His tabernacle. His tabernacle ain't there now. It's going to be there one day. There's going to be one there. And then it's, it's my belief he's going to tear that one down himself and build him one, the one we're fixing to start learning about in chapter 40 of Ezekiel. My tabernacle, verse 27, also shall be with them, yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen, the nations, shall know that I, the Lord, do sanctify Israel, when, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forever. There's lots of forevers and forevermore in these scriptures that are talking about things that are to come, things that are with no doubt ahead of us in our future. Lots of things in here. And 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 if you wonder why I'm trying to point and I'm trying to nail this down, is because there is so much, so much heretical teaching out there about the end times, about what's coming. When the Bible, if you would just read the whole Bible and not cherry pick what you want to cherry pick, because I can take this Bible, if, if somebody ain't never seen this Bible before, I can take this Bible and I can prove to you that you're supposed to hate your mother and you're supposed to hate your father and you're supposed to hate your children and you're supposed to stone anybody and kill that comes on your property. If you don't know that much about this Bible, you can take this Bible and twist it and turn it around and make it mean anything that you want to. But if you don't consider the whole entire Bible, then you're going to mess up. And I've done it. We've all done it. But, but, but beyond that, there's lots of people out there making a good living teaching you dead wrong things about what's coming when the Bible's plain. If we'll we just dig in there and pay attention to what God says and listen to what He's saying. Israel will always be His chosen people. The church has never replaced Israel. Israel has never been forgotten by God. They've never been put away forever by God. They will always be His chosen people. There will always be Israel, and there will always be the bride. Israel is the wife of Jehovah, and the church is the bride of Christ. There's two wedding ceremonies coming. There's two marriage feasts coming. One of them takes place in heaven, and the other one takes place on the ground. Jesus comes to earth, and the angels say, Everybody gather for the great feast of the great God. It'll always be separate. It'll always be two separate entities. There's always going to be promises to the nation of Israel, and there's always going to be promises to the church. And all of these things are forever. See, it's hard It's hard to believe. It's hard, it's hard to think of it in those terms. And I have to give my daddy credit for pointing this out to me. But a hundred million years from now, when every word that's in this book is behind us, in the past, when we can lay a finger on any place in the prophecy of this book and say, yeah, this happened on that day. This happened on that day. And, and it's all done. It's all finished. It's, there's nothing else in here that's in the future. Somehow or another, this book says that this word is established forever. So this Bible, this Word, the Word of God, the unchangeable, unfathomable Word of God will be pertinent somehow forever. And we serve a God smart enough to write a book like that. And nobody can prove it wrong. Nobody can prove it different. I tell atheist people all the time, I say, do you really believe that this is the, this is the first generation of atheists that think they're smart enough to disprove the Bible? I said, it's hard to find on the internet, but you can go back to the days of the fathers of the church, the first century, and you can find the writings of the atheist fathers, the doubters and the scoffers, because Paul and Peter, they all said they're all here right now. Peter said that the spirit of Antichrist is here right now. Paul stood on the creek bank on the, on the, on the shore and said, I'm telling you right now that, that there's going to be men come to you and even amongst yourselves, there's going to raise up people who will dispute the truth, who will dispute the Christ. They've always been there. 
This ain't the first generation that's ever said the Bible's wrong and tried to prove it, and they can't. Because for 2,000 years now, it's been going, and it's been going strong. And in 100 million years from now, it's still going to be pertinent. It's still going to mean something. It's still going to I, I promise you, every name in this book, uh, you think of how many people's lived from, from Cain and Abel to now. How many people have been born? And you compare that to how many names made it into this, this book and been recorded there forever. I promise you, you didn't, your name didn't get into this book for no reason whatsoever because your name is going to be remembered and spoke of until the ends of time. It's going to be pertinent somehow or another. I don't know what got me off on that rant. Any, any comments or questions or gripes or complaints? <laughs> okay. Thank you for listening.